Uh, so, can I, can I, I'm sorry, yeah. can I sure, sure. So, do you have the sign-in sheet? So, sorry before you guys get to today, <laughs> just uh, find the roster and sign-in. Okay? Sorry, thank sorry. you. Uh, so my dad uh, did, if any of you are old enough to remember the speak and spell from Texas Instruments, that's based on his speech synthesis chip. So after, after I was done taking apart all the electronics around the house, I got interested in how the human body worked. Uh, so I, I ended up going into medicine after uh, useful classes like Pascal and Fortran in undergrad. Uh, so I still do some computer stuff and kind of help run the computers and keep them working. Uh, so we have several people in the radiology department as well as here in biomedical informatics who have interests in imaging informatics, one part of that. Uh, and I have a, a course I kind of try to offer every spring. We haven't done the past couple of years. But if enough people are interested in imaging informatics, uh, we can offer that class to you and talk about uh, kind of all the things that we deal in imaging informatics. Uh, and I'll give kind of a brief introduction and touch on a lot of these different uh, places and subjects today. Uh, but if any of you are interested, we can delve into much more detail in imaging informatics in those different areas. Uh, so in, in this world, we kind of talk about a lot of different things, uh, where imaging informatics fits in with biomedical informatics, and kind of the big trifecta for us historically has been PACS, speech, and RIS, these three systems that we use all the time. We'll talk about how they integrate and how we can best make them most efficient and work together for us. Because that's a big thing for us. For me, for example, I'm a full-time radiologist here, so I want to be as efficient as I possibly can in all my studies and how I deal with the computer systems around me and how I still keep efficient is a big deal that I'm thinking about all the time. And this is where we started. Uh, this is what I was doing 20, 25 years ago. Uh, we had little dictaphones we'd walk around with and I had my favorite one. The cassettes never got stuck on it. And we'd put those cassettes and give them to the speech recognition people or the, uh, you know, the teletranscriptionist who would just listen to the report and type it all up for it. And working on hard copy films. Uh, so we had a big move, and this was our roloscope we had here uh, 20 years ago, uh, where we'd just go through the films, and the tech would uh, hang the films on the other one and, as while I read it on one. And we've moved from that now to PACS, to the computers that we look at, which makes a lot more sense because we acquire the images digitally, so it makes more sense to look at them like that. But this is not something that makes me more efficient because now I'm the one hanging the films. And things like uh, PACS as well as speech recognition make me less efficient. Now I'm editing my own reports. So you have me, the guy you kind of think of the, the top of the ladder in, in radiology and in medical imaging, being less efficient. So we want to think about all these computer systems we use and how to get the most efficiency we possibly can out of them. And that's a big part kind of of imaging informatics. Uh, now in biomedical informatics in this bigger picture, imaging informatics is kind of a big pillar of that. And if we think about informatics as just kind of all this data that we work in, how we acquire this data, construct it, put it together, and put it in. We have biomedical informatics. That's all that dealing with medicine. And then we have this big area where there's research going on, and we're looking at different techniques and methods that we use for this. And all of that is being applied not only in basic research, but we talk about uh, these different pillars kind of of biomedical informatics. Uh, we have this big area of bioinformatics, imaging informatics, clinical informatics, and public health informatics that we all deal with. And each of these, you know, you guys are looking at this basic research, and we always talk about bench side to bedside. All of those, that basic research is going through these areas to be applied all the time uh, in applied research. And we can think about these in a lot of different ways. We can think about uh, bioinformatics as cellular and molecular processes. For me, in the imaging world, we're really looking at organs and tissues all the time. Uh, for clinical informatics, it's focusing on the patient. And then we have public health looking at society and population. And all of these have both research going immediately kind of in the uh, applied research, going directly to the patient. And we have stuff kind of going back and basic research going back and forth. Uh, but these are kind of the three big pillars that I think about as biomedical informatics. And for me, today, we're going to zoom in on imaging informatics and focus on that you know, pillar in those areas. Because what we're really dealing with here is the image and all the things we do with it. We generate the image, we manage it, we manipulate it, and we integrate it with something else. These are the big steps. So in the imaging informatics world, we're doing everything around the medical image. What do we do with it all the way from acquisition all the way through uh, you know, teaching files and follow-up clinical research? 
So we start off with generating the image, and we digitize it if necessary, and it, it really makes more sense to look at it digitally. It, it sounds silly now, but years ago, we would acquire this digital image with a modality, and the first thing we did was we printed off an analog version of it. Now it just sounds stupid. It's like 30 years ago, I would go to a library and check out an encyclopedia to read and learn about stuff. Like, you know, now I have the entire wealth of human knowledge in my pocket at all times. Uh, we manage the image, we store it, we transmit it, uh, we look at it, uh, we manipulate it, we do all kind of processing, both pre-processing and post-processing the image, and then hopefully we integrate it with EMR or with other systems. So we have all this stuff that's kind of the life cycle of the image in imaging informatics, and everything that revolves around that data is kind of our world of imaging informatics. So we kind of have a life cycle of what happens with that. At some point, a clinician desires an imaging study. So usually we, we, we would talk in surgery about the flying wedge. We'd have the attending and the chief residents and the residents and the medical students and the PAs and the nurse, and they'd all be going down the hallway, the flying wedge, and they'd go in the patient's room and they'd put on their stethoscope and listen and talk to the patient, and they'd decide that they needed a study. So the attending would say, you know, let's order a uh, MRI of the brain on Mr. Wilson in bed three to uh, rule out something, idiopathic hypertrophy pachy meningitis. And he would tell the chief resident, who'd tell the resident, who would go down and, and tell the huck, you know, that we need that study. And the procedure is requested and scheduled, and hopefully we get some clinical information. So that resident would run down to the work and said, I need an MRI in Mr. Wilson in bed three. And they'd go, okay, MRI, we can do it today at two. Uh, what's the clinical indication? And he'd say, rule out abnormality. So then we go do the study, right? And it says something helpful like rule out abnormality or look for pathology. So we do the study and we protocol it. Somebody calls me and says, I got a request for an MRI on this guy. What kind of study do you want to do? And I said, well, why are we doing it? I said, well, rule out abnormality. I said, okay, we'll just do an MRI of the brain without. Uh, so then we review the images and there's a perception and interpretation. Is it normal or is it abnormal? And then if it's abnormal, what is it? And I try to say something in the report that's clinically relevant. And in my world, the more clinical information I get now through the EMR, the more likely I am to say something to help with the patient's care. Uh, we create a report, that's our communication. Uh, depending on where radiologists go, it's possible they may be sitting in the basement in the dark and their only relationship with the referring docs is this report. So we wanna be very careful what that report says. Uh, then we have some quality control and workflow monitoring that goes on and uh, you know, continuing education and training and that communication goes out to the referring doc. And then if he doesn't understand something, he calls us and we have a conversation and we can do all this natural language processing stuff on the back. So he calls me up and says, uh, you, what about this MRI? And I said, yeah, it looks good. And he goes, well, I, I know she didn't give contrast. And I said, why would I give contrast? And he says, well, to rule out idiopathic hypertrophic pachy meningitis. That's why I ordered it. And I said, why would I be looking for idiopathic hypertrophic pachy meningitis? And he said, well, that's what the request. And I said, no, the request says rule out abnormality. So we want to integrate all these systems, CPOE, something else, where we can get that clinical information, and we have a EMR interface where I try to pull out the data that I think is most pertinent to the radiologist and display it to them so that they get that clinical information when they're reading the study as well as when they're protocoling. So in our world in imaging informatics, we have all these steps that are kind of CDS, clinical decision support stuff that's going on. So there's stuff for their referring docs, helping them decide which kind of study to order. When a guy comes into the ER with low back pain, maybe we don't need a contrasted MRI of the spine, maybe we can start with plain film. So there's systems that help them order that. Then there's systems to help radiologists protocol study. If somebody says idiopathic hypertrophic pachy meningitis, maybe you wanna go give contrast in that study. And then there's clinical decision support like teaching files where we can show you pictures of what idiopathic hypertrophic pachy meningitis looks like and you can guess if that looks the same as what you're looking at. So there are several different steps along the course where in our world, clinical decision support is kind of helping us. So we have all these steps that are RAB, and these are all things that are, are kind of discussed and described in this society sim, the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine. So this is kind of the largest imaging informatics group. Uh, I'm the program chair of this society, so we put together the program every year. Uh, we have speakers from all over the world, thousands of members uh, who all come and discuss these things, and we have a website there's a webinar actually going on right now. Uh, we do online webinars and tweet chats and things, and uh, we have an online e-community where all this imaging informatics world kind of lives for us as a portal. Uh, so everything really is kind of discussed in that imaging informatics, from desktop support, when is this you know, version of Windows sundowning, all the way up to very complicated things 
uh, you know, wearable technology. Uh, you know, I can push radiologic images to my watch and look at them. Uh, anywhere I am, somebody can text me and ask me to look at a study. If I have Wi-Fi anywhere in the world, I can pull it up and look at it. So I can get a text, you know, if I'm, I was in Singapore, and somebody texts me, hey, uh, you know, Mr. Wilson had an MRI of his brain. Does the lesion on the left look bigger? And I pull it up and look at it and take it back. No, it looks like it's smaller. You know, maybe radiation is working. And he's, the surgeon says, oh, great, you know, wonderful. Are you available for lunch today? I said, I'd love to, but I'm not there I'm on the other side of the world. So they have no idea where I am. So the referring docs don't know if I'm down the hallway or if I'm on the other side of the earth. With Wi-Fi anywhere I am, I'm connected. I can look at images and, and interact with them. So it's another way the world is very flat and much smaller than it was. So we have these core knowledge domains that we talk about, not only analytics and uh, the clinical and operational data, but enterprise imaging. We know it's not just radiology anymore. We've had you know, cardiology, neurosurgery, uh, vascular surgery, all these guys kind of come into radiology and are much more involved. So the radiologist is kind of getting out of the dark room and working with the other referring docs much more. Uh, productivity and workflow is a big thing. All these sites have different uh, workflows and we all have our own little, little idiosyncrasies of how we set up our systems, how PACs, speech, and risks interact. We used to think that if different shops had the same PACs, speech, and risk system that we could really discuss in, in level detail about, oh, you do this, well, we can do, well, we know everybody's set up completely differently. We all use systems completely differently. So just because you have the same big three trifecta of systems at Imaging Infrax doesn't mean that your shop is anything like that other guy's shop over there. And then we have quality, all the things about informatics, and we talk about dashboard and data mining and big data and, and how to use this for our most efficiency and, and better patient care. Uh, the society is kind of an odd interaction with the vendors as well. Uh, we have the vendors, we try to get them to come out and give talks and interact in panels and a lot of interactivity. This is a place where all the guys in imaging informatics from MD, PhDs to desktop support, PhDs, PACS administrators, uh, IT people can all get together and really discuss their own experiences. How did you solve this problem and everywhere else? So we have a lot of these vendors not only uh, give talks but be involved in, in panels and a lot of things like that. So it's, it's kind of an interesting niche between some of these other societies. And a lot of them, like HIMSS, are recognizing imaging informatics and enterprise imaging informatics. How do we get visible light and all these other things into a central archive where everybody can look at medical images? So SIM is working with HIMSS to have joint sessions and increase imaging informatics at HIMSS conference, as well as uh, outreach kind of regional meetings and international meetings. Uh, so that's the society SIM that has kind of an interesting uh, history in the imaging informatics world. So first we generate the image, and the big deal of this is the modalities that we use all the time. So we have all these modalities that we use all day long every day, and from chest x-rays all the way to very complex cross-sectional imaging, CT and MRI. And this is what we're thinking about. And it, it's not just radiology anymore. With cardiology, vascular surgery, neurosurgery, all these other groups are kind of moving in. And you know, some of them are kind of taking parts out and carving them away from radiology. But we're trying to work with all these groups and have them integrated into our PAC system and speech and risk, uh, dictate reports. And there's all these issues with technical and professional billing that we're dealing with all these uh, referring docs kind of all the time. So we know that medical imaging is not just radiology anymore. That was part of the reason for changing the name of that society from SCAR, the Society of Computer Applications and Radiology, to SIM, the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine. Uh, so kind of reaching outside of radiology and recognizing that medical imaging is a much bigger deal. And it's a relatively new specialty. It was only about 100 years ago uh, that this guy, Rowenchen, found these x-rays. So he was working with vacuum tubes and he had this fluorescent screen on the other side of his lab from another research project. And he noticed that every time he turned on current in the vacuum tube that this fluorescent screen started to glow. Then he didn't know what it was that was causing it, but when he turned it off, it would slowly fade away. When he turned the current back on, the screen would glow. He locked himself in his lab for a couple of days, wouldn't let anyone enter out. He didn't know what was going across, but he just, so he just called it x-rays. And that's the same thing we talk about now, x-rays and how we use them. And it's a kind of electromagnetic radiation, but it's kind of still the basics of most of what we do in radiology. So in medicine, this is a pretty new field. Uh, so this theoretically is a picture of him, and one of the first x-rays is his hand. Some people say it's his wife's hand, but uh, it's a neat way to see inside the body. So there's a little voyeuristic aspect of medical imaging that, that we talk about all the time. And that's still basically the same thing that's done now. Uh, so we generate chest x-rays, still the most common radiologic study that's done. 
And when I got here uh, 20 years ago or so, we had these processors. Uh, so you take the film and expose it and put it in this machine. It would run through all the rollers. And we came by three times a day and checked its temperature, you know, a little temperature thing. And checked the temperature of the fluids and be sure they're all working. And you rolled it out and then you dried off the film and put stickers on it and then we read it. Uh, now, of course, we do it digitally. So we're thinking about data and the size of data. So a chest x-ray might be about 10 megabytes, you know, depending on your spatial and contrast resolution. And we have some very high resolution modalities like digital MAMO that might be 40 or more, maybe 60 megabytes for each image. So suddenly we're generating a lot of data all the time. And we have fluoro studies. Uh, this is a, uh, C, a fluoro example of a patient who's moving their head. Maybe not. Oh. Disaster. So we can uh, position a patient and, and do x-rays continuously all the time on them. And we have plain x-rays and we have uh, CT images. We have all these different modalities that we use all the time. Disappoint. I want to send data to Microsoft about this problem. So the chest x-ray is still the most commonly uh, performed procedure, the most common thing that we do uh, all the time in radiology. And uh, we're thinking all the time about the amount of data that we generate now, because I may generate 10 or 20 ter uh, terabytes of data a year, while the other hospital generates a relatively small amount of data all the time. Uh, so I have digital fluoro where I put contrast in it and uh, have people either drink it or plug from below and put in contrast and take x-rays. Those may be relatively small size, a megabyte for each. But the amount of data I generate overall is really big. Radiology may generate 10 or 20 terabytes of data a year, more than the rest of the hospital. You know, I generate more than a day than the rest of the hospital at a year. And when pathology goes completely fully digital, they're going to generate petabytes of data a year. They're going to make radiology and the rest of the hospital look small. Uh, so er, in the early 1920s, somebody figured out, hey, you know what would be neat is if we could inject something in blood vessels that would show up on x-rays but not kill the patient. That would be cool. And they came up with angiography. And then we had digital subtraction angiography uh, where we can inject contrast and actually see it show up on blood vessels. And those images are relatively small, just a megabyte in each one. But a study may have a whole bunch of different images. And there's a type of kind of lossy compression that goes on here. I do an angio study where I put in a catheter and inject contrast, and I take a whole bunch of images. And then the tech goes through those images, and they choose a couple that they think are best and save those. So it's kind of a little bit of an image compression going on right there at that step. And a lot of what I do in the neuroradiology world is CT and MRI. These are even newer techniques. They've only been around about 40 years, CT and MRI. So this is one of the first CT images. It took days to just construct a single image. And you know, originally, we'd have about 10 images for each study. Uh, and this is a CT scanner. So we have something that's generating x-rays and something that's detecting the x-rays. And it's spinning around really fast. So this is just an example video of one uh, that's open. So you see why we have it closed, because we ask patients to voluntarily stick part of their body in the middle of that. But this machine is really just a big, stupid densometer. It's looking at densities of stuff. So bone is very dense, so it's white. Air is not dense, so it's black. Everything else is kind of in between. But the neat thing is I can look at the density of stuff and sometimes tell you the pathology. So this is an axial CT. It's a bone algorithm. And these permeative changes right here <laughs> next to this, this is your ear hole right there where you shove the Q-tips in that your ears trying to clear out the wax all the time. So these permeative changes tell me that this is a type of tumor called a paraganglioma. And if I have sclerotic changes with increased density, that's what a meningioma looks like. And if I have smooth scallop margins, that's what a schwannoma looks like. Three different types of tumors, uh, one that's very vascular, uh, one that's extraaxial and causes a sclerotic change in the bone, and one that causes benign changes. So I can do this kind of study, a CT, I can look at the images, and I can tell you exactly what the pathology is before you go do surgery or a biopsy or anything else. So that's pretty cool. Now, one CT image may be about half a megabyte in size, depending on your resolution and your vendor. But we have uh, hundreds of images in each one. So suddenly, we have thousands of images in each CT study that we do. So then we have MRI. So we have this big magnetic field. So I have this MRI scanner that's 30,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. 
and we're mostly water. We're about 70% water, and the planet's about 70% water, so that worked out well for us. Uh, and where, so when we put your body in, the protons tend to align magnetic field. We push radio frequencies on it. That spins off. It gives a little bit of energy out. And we can do MRIs of pretty much the whole body. And it looks kind of like a, a CT scan image, but it's really different because we're looking at the biophysical properties of these tissues all the time. And it's an MRI with a very strong magnetic field, 30,000 times stronger than the Earth's. So there's this field that kind of goes around it and is involved with uh, the scanner itself. So here we tied a string to this a pair of scissors and we moved it around so we can get an idea how that field kind of goes through the middle and around the outside of the scanner. And that's something important for us to remember because the MRI scanner is always on so all the stuff that people use in medicine can get pulled into this thing. So things like stethoscopes, if you have scissors in your pocket, they get pulled in. And because of the field, you see how it goes in and out and in and out and in and out, back and forth all the time. We, we went and got a high frame rate camera just to take these videos. We had a couple of MRI scanners that we couldn't sell or take down, so we, we ended up just throwing stuff, uh, uh, doing important medical research okay. over weekend before we <laughs> kind of took apart the scanner. Uh, so this is an IV pole, so you see those red uh, marks around it. That's supposed to mean that it's safe to go in the MRI scanner. <laughs> Not so, it's Dennis Parker, that's right. Uh, so that's the director of UKR research uh, wig kind of over at MRI and stuff. And the worst thing, unfortunately, is oxygen tanks. Uh, you know, MRI scanners kill people. So from zero to 40 miles an hour, and there's actually a, whoop, there's a piece of concrete that's embedded in the wall in the back of that, uh, way behind. So the, the thing to remember is that these scanners are on all the time. We don't turn them off. So if I skip ahead here. So we got some concrete blocks and threw a bit then. You see this oxygen tank goes from zero to 40 miles an hour, and back here there's a piece of that concrete block in the wall that actually gets stuck 15 feet behind it. So MRI scanners kill people. The problem is that this is what the public thinks about them. You know, you see TV shows and movies like James Bond here, the guy's got a gun, so what does he do? He turns on the MRI scanner, and all the metal stuff gets pulled up against it, the, and then James Bond runs over there, and he turns off the machine, and he grabs a gun, and he shoots at the bad guy. I don't know why people don't just shoot James Bond as soon as they see him. It seems like if I was a bad guy, would it? But it's really not like that. Uh, they're on all the time. So this is a, a video clip outside our MRI scanner. And this is a guy who's helping out. He thinks he's helping uh, bring the bed in the room. And of course, you don't bring the bed in the room. The bed is detachable. Uh, so a couple of years ago, in 2006, uh, the bed got pulled out of his hands. This is my MRI tech. He's taking out the patient. And this bed is detachable. You bring it out. So you see this guy start to break in the bed over here. Suddenly the bed gets pulled out of his hand and slams up against the back of the MRI tech. And he's, he's trapped there for a second. That's him screaming. He had these huge black and blue marks down his leg. He lost feeling in his leg. Uh, so unfortunately, bad things happen with this. Not only oxygen tanks, uh, you know, the, if a cop thinks he's helping and he runs in there to help subdue, his gun can get pulled out and go off. The firing pin is magnetic. Bad things happen all the time. So unfortunately, MRI scanners kill people. But the important thing here is the MRI scanner is on all the time. It's not like on TV, we turn it off every now and then. Those images are also relatively small, may only about be a half a megabyte, but there's hundreds, maybe thousands of images in each MRI study. So that's a lot of data also. Uh, so then we have nuclear medicine, another thing where we're looking at biophysical properties of tissues. Uh, we can take out your blood, make it radioactive, put it back in you, put you under a giant gamma camera, and then detect where the radioactivity is coming off of. And it's helpful to combine that with other techniques. So if I have a CT scan, I can combine that with a PET study and see this little tumor that's right here. And if I combine it into a PET CT, that's helpful because I see both the anatomy and the biophysical properties of tissues. So that's a neat thing for us. And nuclear medicine is frequently a relatively low resolution, can be relatively high, again, depending on your modality and, and what exactly you're doing. Uh, so that's nuclear medicine as an imaging modality. Uh, then we have ultrasound, where we're generating and receiving sound waves. We push radio frequencies on you, uh, sound waves on you, when they bounce back. We receive them and make pictures. Uh, we can do pretty pictures and 3D recons. You might see things in the newspaper about, you know, getting intrauterine baby pictures, not for medical use, uh, big things. Some people are worried about uh, ultrasounding babies too much. Nobody's quite sure exactly what happens when we do this all the time. Uh, but it's also very good for interventional stuff. Because I can hold a ultrasound probe and hold a needle in the other hand, and this is me making passes through a lymph node uh, in somebody's neck. So it's portable, it's not using any radiation, 
and uh, you can do interventional procedures with it. And uh, ultrasound nowadays is often acquired kind of in video clips. So while each image may be relatively small, it may generate a whole bunch of data because it's actually re requiring it in video. So anytime I think about these modalities, for example, if somebody just calls me and says, I've got a guy with a headache, what kind of study should I do? I'm thinking about all this stuff, the modality, uh, the spatial resolution uh, of the image, how many images are in a study and how much data it is. This is what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about storage, how much space we need for storage all the time. But I'm thinking also about the contrast, the spatial resolution and temporal resolution to get that data, how much data is in each study. And I have some idea of you know, which uses radiation, which is portable, uh, which looks at anatomy versus physiology. And not everybody always knows this. Uh, we're academics, so every July we get a bunch of new students come in. So usually about once a July we get a phone call for a portable MRI scanner. It's a huge three-ton thing. And I say, yes, sir, I'll pick up that MRI scanner and come right up to the ICU for you to do it. <laughs> People don't quite understand what we're doing all the time. So that's a discussion we have all day long, is kind of what study is the best one to do. Uh, but because these studies are all generating a huge amount of data, we have this giant data overload. So when I started in radiology 20 or 25 years ago, we're looking at you know, maybe 1,000 images a day. And now I'm looking at 100,000 images a day. And I'm getting reimbursed less for all those studies. So how do we deal with this in terms of productivity and workflow? How do I be as efficient as I possibly can? PACs and speech make me less efficient. They make the enterprise more efficient because the referring doc gets the report faster, but they make me less efficient. So I want to be as efficient as I possibly can in going through those cases because I'm looking at a lot more data than I used to just a little while ago. And especially when the modalities advance. Computers are getting smarter, smarter all the time and uh, faster. I can go through your whole body in about seven seconds and make 0.4 millimeter thick CT images. So I can generate a huge amount of data. So when we think about the amount of data we generate, uh, some things like MRI is increasing a little bit. Digital MAMO is obviously increasing a lot as we start being digitally. But as we start doing multi-slice CT scanners, if we have a 256 slice 512 slice CT scanner, I can generate a whole lot of data really fast, especially with all the reconstructions in different planes. So image overload is, is a big thing that radiologists are dealing with all the time. So in imaging informatics, we have these three big systems, PAC, speech, and RIS. And we kind of group all the other parts of imaging informatics together in terms of management and manipulation into one big area. Uh, we talk about a lot of things like anywhere else in the computer field, like ergonomics and uh, reading room design and stuff like that. The human computer interface is a big deal. I want the radiologist's eyes to be on the images. I don't want him looking at the speech recognition system. I don't want him looking at the wrists. I want him looking at the PACs. PACs is where images live. Speech is where the reports live. RIS is where studies are scheduled and where they are. But how they all interact is a big deal for us. So just in the environmental design, just like everywhere else, we're thinking about uh, physical considerations as well as ergonomics. And it was a big change for us from where we were just 20 or 30 years ago, walking around with our own handheld dictaphone to just sitting in front of a computer all day long. So fortunately, the government is here to help, right? Uh, OSHA puts out standards on ergonomics and what they think we should be doing uh, all the time. Uh, we talk about the neutral body position and ergonomics, your thighs parallel to the ground and where they should be. Uh, we look at different body positions. Uh, there's a neutral, there's a declined and a reclined position that are kind of recommended by OSHA. Uh, so we think about these things when we design our desks. So we have fancy tables that go up and down. Uh, we get fancy chairs with er back support and uh, they can do all these different positions on them. Uh, or we can stand up at the computer monitor and do that. So we design our computer room so that we can do all these things. So we can raise those desks way up high and stand up. It's supposed to be better for us now. Uh, we have little ergonomic balls some people like to balance on or stand on. Uh, you can get little platforms to balance on. Some of the radiologists spend a lot of time talking about working their core. I'm not sure where that is yet, but they spend a lot of time working on that. Uh, this, this is one of the balance balls. My resident wanted to be sure you knew that she, she was wearing heels when she did this. So it was a lot harder than me and some of the other people. And we even have these little balance ball kind of things that you can stand on and support. Uh, so trying to be healthier ergonomics and how we arrange everything uh, while we dictate all the time. Uh, I'm still pretty relaxed, just chilling back at the end of the day. 
I get pretty good speech recognition to this position, and uh, I could still relax and get through everything. Uh, but somebody actually did studies on this. They actually stuck pressure probes in lumbar discs and measured how much pressure is on each disc. So we have our vertebral bodies, these hard things, and in between is the soft, squishy stuff, the disc. And if there's more pressure, it's supposed to be more likely to bulge out. So people actually looked at different positions and how much pressure, thank you, is applied to each one as they go through. Uh, so we have some idea of, you know, sitting in this relaxed position. So this is always my argument that I have less pressure on my discs if I'm relaxed and sitting back. It turns out sitting up straight is actually bad for us. Our parents were wrong all the time. <laughs> so we talk about those ergonomics all the time and making adjustments. We know that sitting for long periods are bad. Uh, we talk about the 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes we're supposed to look away from the monitors and focus on something at least 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Uh, we're supposed to get up and walk around every now and then. Uh, the little Fitbits and uh, devices, I watch and Moto 360 things are uh, popular remind us to get up and walk around and move. Uh, so we also have issues all the time with lighting uh, in our reading room design and, and everything else and how we set it up. So lighting problems, we know those bright lights are bulb uh, bad, if, especially if they're shining straight on the monitor and they increase uh, eye strain. So we try to place, uh, place the lights parallel to line of sight, not directly shining on the monitors, just like everything else in ergonomics. Uh, we install light diffusers so that the light's not directing us. Maybe it's pointing up and then bouncing around. Uh, and supplemental light sources, little lights. And there are actually rules about how much background light you're supposed to have if you have a CRT monitor or an LCD. So we think about these things sometimes with reading room design. And everything from the, com the monitors, how they have it set up, where you put lights, uh, even the color of the rooms. Somebody found out that kind of a dark brown is kind of the best color to paint the walls. And it's always funny when you ask somebody to paint the walls. This kid, you, you sure you want this? Kid? Well, it's supposed to be good for reading rooms and looking at computers all day long. Uh, we know bright lights are bad. That's why it's not so good for me to be out at the pool trying to read studies on my uh, laptop, at least for right now. Uh, so we think about these things when we set it up, and sometimes like this, we just have to, uh, we're limited by geography. So we take a room, this used to be a conference room, and, and, and didn't really tear out the tables or anything else. We just replaced it with PAX monitors and put them in. Uh, so we may have lighting that's not very good with an actual outside window, and we may not be able to set it up. Here we have PAX monitors directly opposite each other, so you may get glare from the back of the room or somewhere else. But we have all these rules about things like blinds, Horizontal blinds are supposed to be better for north-south windows and vertical blinds for east-west. There's all this stuff that normally we don't think about in terms of reading room design and ergonomics, how we set it up. Uh, we try to use indirect light or light shielding. Uh, and we think about those environmental factors with lighting, like these windows. Some people like to go in these reading rooms to just open up these windows so light is exact. It's very bad, obviously, for, for trying to read subtle stuff in the dark all the time for radiology. Uh, but some people say that they like to have that light in the room. Uh, glare problems are always something. We, we try to buy mice and keyboards that are not shiny, uh, that are kind of a flat color black on them so they don't glare. And even things like ventilation, uh, there are rules for the air vents. If you've ever been in a, a work environment, you're in a cubicle or something, and there's one of these air vents that every three hours just <laughs> starts to push air down. is <laughs> really annoying. Dries out your eyes is really bad. Uh, so little things like air diffusers could make a big difference from that. And there's actually rules about airflow rates, how, much, how fast air is supposed to be coming out of that thing. And even things like humidity and, and temperature in the room. And if you look closely, there's even different rules for what temperature should be in the summer versus the winter. Uh, when people are wearing more clothes, maybe you may keep the room a little colder. Uh, so just a little thing like an air diffuser can make a big difference in ergonomics and computer use all the time. Uh, so the physical reading room historically has been kind of undesigned. We have take a room where we used to have the rolloscopes and just take out the rolloscopes and put in a PAX workstation. And we usually put them in the same place and then we end up having these arguments. So the rolloscopes, you could kind of hang 12 pieces of film, you know, so many on top and so many on bottom. And when we first started installing PAX in 99 or so here, a lot of the radiologists wanted two rows of monitors. They wanted a row on top and a row on bottom because they're still thinking about it like film like images, when really we want to think about it like data. That we think about it as ones and zeros at this limited level, and it's a data set that we can scroll back and forth through. Uh, when we first put in packs, a lot of people would hang their studies just like hard copy film, kind of 12 on one, 
on each image as they went by, and they insisted on having two rows of four portrait monitors. And of, of course, we ended up not really doing that because you never use that top row. Uh, but you, if you think about it like data instead of film, it's a whole different world. It's not very frequently you go to buy a sweater and you run your credit card and they say, oh, sorry, the American Express server's down. You know, come back a half hour later and try to buy your sweater then. That never happens because you have redundancy everywhere in the system. You set that up very well. So we want to think about that in our design systems. Uh, to try to minimize distractions, sometimes we set up little uh, ante rooms. So when the referring docs first walk into the room, there's somebody there to kind of greet them and find out what their problem is and do they really need a radiologist or try to get the films prepped uh, before they go kind of into the back room where the radiologists are actually working uh, to kind of be a, a gatekeeper uh, to them back there so that these guys can sit back there and actually do the work uh, and that the referring docs aren't coming in. Uh, we have huge problems like CDs just like everybody else with outside studies and you know they don't want to even bother trying to figure it out so they come right to the reading room. And when that guy comes into the reading room, the neurosurgeon walks in with five CDs. Hey, can you look at these outside studies and tell me what you think? We all go, oh, God, because I know the next 45 minutes of my life is gone. You know, I, I have all the medical legal problems because I know he, write, he goes back and writes on the chart. I showed the films to Wiggins. He said, it's a tumor. I'm going to cut it out. <laughs> but I, I have no other technical or professional billing that goes along with that study. But I have all the medical legal risk. Uh, so we try to set up those ergonomic workstations and uh, we try to position the rooms, but frequently we're limited by geography and we just have to kind of shove them in anywhere we can. So if you're building a brand new site, you can think about things like that. When they started doing plans for the new ortho building in Research Park, they had the plans and the layout and the rooms and everything else, and then they came and said, well, you know, what do you think about printing film or going digital and how we should set it up or anything else? And we said, well, you've already made that decision. There's no wet rooms you don't have any of the sewer lines or any of the wet rooms to process the film. So you are going digital. That's not a question. So we have to think about this when we set up the room. From little things like network, you know, is this punch card live on, on, the, uh, on the network bank, or do we have to make all these ethernet connections live to send it? So the human computer interface is a big deal. How does the radiologist interact with all these systems? Uh, the PAX speech and the RIS is kind of the biggest one there. So we think about that kind of as this trifecta for us, the big main systems in radiology. So the big one there is PACS. It, it's P-A-C-S. It's not P-A-X, as we often see. It's Picture Archival and Communication System. And the whole idea is that it's not just the images. It's the network. It's the modalities. It's the reading station. It's everything all in between. So we have pictures, and it really now it's all types of images, visible light and everything else. Uh, we archive everything, with, usually with a short and a long term. So we think about you know, spinning media or something that's fast and then long-term tape archive in the background for your, your disaster recovery that's 90 miles or one fault line away for your disaster recovery. Uh, we communicate by sending the data between the devices and it's a system to remind us that it's all these network devices as well as the network and everything else. So we have all these components from the modalities all the way down uh, through the workstations and we rely on all these standards like DICOM, HL7, IHE. We have all those same discussions. Do we use IHE? Do we use SOA? How do we interact with these a uniform database? And is it better to have a single database? We have discussions about singer, single vendor versus best uh, vendor, what we should get. And we know that frequently the single vendor discussion is kind of silly because it's often just who that guy bought last week. It may be a completely different company. It doesn't mean it'll work any better with their system than anybody else's. Uh, so we want easier interpretation in comparison to prior studies. So 20 years ago, if I got a study and I knew there was a prior, I would take it down and give it back to the file room and say, call me when you have the prior, bring it back when you have And they would go over to the Word, they'd drive around, they'd make phone calls, and sometimes a couple of days later they found the prior and brought it back, and then I could compare it with that and say if the tumor's bigger, smaller, or same. Well now, of course, I just search on the PACs and I can pull it up and look at it right away. Uh, so we have a lot of, of faster and more accurate diagnosis for our patients. I have immediate access anywhere, anywhere in the world. If I have Wi-Fi, I can technically connect to the system and pull up images and look at them 24-7. And theoretically, we have better uh, patient safety through this. Uh, peer consultation is great because uh, I, I can't just hold on to the hard copy film and show it to somebody later. I can call anybody anywhere in the system, and it doesn't matter where they are. Hey, can you pull up Wilson and tell me what you think this is? I have no idea. what And we can compare and consult each other on that. 
Uh, so theoretically, we have a lot fewer patient delays, better report turnaround time, uh, better satisfaction from both uh, the patient, the radiologist, and the referring doc. Uh, we've reduced a lot of lost or misplaced films. Again, it sounds silly, but years ago, we would do a study in the middle of the night and print them out and give them to the nurse surgery resident. And the next morning, happened all the time, the chief resident would come down and say, hey, I need the films on Wilson. And I said, yeah, I gave it to your resident last night. You know, I, I had to come in and print it out for him. And he goes, well, I don't know where he is. He's off service. He went home. I need you to print it out again. So we go print it out again. You know, another 12 bucks or whatever it is, a page. And then, you know, two hours later, the attending calls. Hey, I need the films on Wilson brought up to OR3 right now. And I said, yeah, I gave them to your chief resident just an hour ago. Well, I don't know where he is. Print them out again and have him send it. We'd print out everything like five times over and over again. Obviously, I don't have to do that with ones and zeros. Uh, so basic kind of workflow. Somebody orders a study, it gets sent to the wrist, it's scheduled, it's sent to the modality, uh, the patient comes in and does it, we do images. We may connect to the PAC server to pull up old images, and then we read out the studies at a reporting station and you can see it. So it's a little more complicated when we think about all the other systems that are in there and the data warehouse and everything else. Uh, but we can sketch this out. And this is the sketch we did here in 2000 for our PAC system where we had the hospital, uh, we had multi-mode fiber, OC12 all over the place, all these different reading stations as well as reading rooms, and the main hospital with all the modalities, and the reading rooms. It, you see that neuroradiology was the center of the University of Utah at that time. Uh, but that you can make out this sketch, and we had some idea of redundancy of the network and where everything was. Uh, so we kind of signed a deal with this company in 98 uh, to install this PAX and started installing it in, in 99. And we were one of the first few sites that was completely filmless relatively early on. So we see good things. We're printing out less film. Well, that's obvious. Some places go cold turkey. Uh, the referring docs don't like that because they still like film sometimes. So we try to do a, a slower transition here. If you just tell the referring docs, nope, I'm not printing out any more film. Sometimes I say, well, fine. I'll just start sending my patients over here because those guys will print out film for us. Uh, so we had better productivity of uh, the technologist and better productivity of the radiologist. We needed less personnel. Uh, you know, ones and zeros are small and they're easy to push around, so I don't need a lot of personnel in the fire room driving around to the data warehouse and finding old studies and moving them around. Uh, so the report turnaround time dropped way down really fast. Our increased patient throughput, uh, what we could measure in its contribution of radiology dropped way down. And the radiologists were more productive. Uh, so again, we think about all the amount of data that we generate all the time uh, from these images and e from each of those modalities. Uh, and we actually made that chart. So this is a chart I made, uh, I think in 2000, and I figured out that we were generating about 6.3 terabytes of data a year. And if you think about prefetching and, and how much data we do, it was total about 10 terabytes of data we were moving around uh, every year at that time. And now we do about a third of a million studies we generate about 20 terabytes of data a year now. So when I'm thinking about the archive and how we set that up, we need to be sure we have enough data to save it. And then how long do you save images? Do you save PEDS and MAMO for forever and everything else for seven years? Do you want to throw it away? Sometimes the legal guys want us to throw it away after seven years, because then there's not much medical legal risk. If I can't show you the images, you can't prove anything. Uh, I, as a radiologist, want to save everything all the time, because even if there was a study from 10 years ago, I want to compare it side by side with what I have now. And to be able to do that is a big deal. So when we think about how much data we have, if we're comparing a, a multi-slice scanner and we think about how much data a single scanner will create, if we have a much higher slice scanner, you know, a single slice rather than a multi-slice, we can be, go from one terabyte a year to nine terabytes really quickly just by changing out one of our modalities. So if you think about upgrading all of your modalities, CT and MRI at your shop, if you're at some place that has 10 CT scanners that are multi-slice and they're scanning 24-7, you're talking about a huge amount of data really fast. Uh, so uh, here, uh, the company that we're working with, Marconi, uh, got bought by Philips. Uh, Marconi had two big divisions. They had a medical division and IT. And the medical division was making some money, but the IT was making a lot. So they decided to set off the medical division. And then, of course, the crash happened. So they lost a huge amount of money. And the medical kept making money a little bit that they had sold with Philips. Uh, and then GE bought AppliCare, the company that was kind of making our PAC system. So we were trying to decide out where, where to go and, and what to do after that. So we were kind of PAC shopping. And there's hundreds of different PAX vendors. It's a huge market, billion dollar market. Uh, and there's a lot of different vendors you can look at. And there's good and bad features of all of these. 
Frequently, the PAX software is written by some computer science double E guy. So maybe not all the features make sense to me as a radiologist for how it functions and how it works, but somebody adds something that he thinks looks good. And we know that it's a huge market, and it's changed now, obviously, from PAX installation and going from analog to digital to now what is really PAX replacement that companies are focusing on moving in. And there's a lot of different reasons to kind of outgrow your PAX, but that's the big market right now for these companies is replacing somebody else's PAX. So that's a big deal for us. You're dealing with two different vendors and companies all the time when you do that. Yeah. Uh, it depends on where you are. The North America is different than Europe, is, is different than other places, and the companies focus on different markets. Uh, but the big ones, GE, Agfa, Philips, and, and Siemens, have the, the bulk of the market in North America. And uh, there's good and bad of all the different systems. There's good and bad features of all of those. Some of them have things I really like and some things that just seem stupid. And uh, you know, everybody has pluses and minuses. And because all the shops are set up differently, uh, everybody uses them differently, even if you have the exact same version of the exact same system. Uh, so just because it works great over there doesn't mean it necessarily to work great here. Uh, so there's a lot of criteria. We think about a well-established company. Some people talk about a single vendor, but we know sometimes that that's just who they bought last week. Uh, GB, GE was buying different PAX companies almost every year, so they were demoing a different system almost every year at our SNA, our big conference. Uh, so we know that that's not always the best thing with a single vendor. Uh, having a vendor who's not likely to get bought out or go out of business seems like a good thing. Do you want support? You want your technology to be cutting edge and comply with all the standards. And it's nice to have an open architecture and uh, to be able to get COTS, commercial off-the-shelf stuff, to go down to Office Depot and buy a monitor rather than have Siemens tell you that you have to buy this $20,000 monitor uh, every time it goes out to go with your PAC system. Uh, so behind all of that is the database. And when you make an arrangement with a PAX vendor, a lot of people will say it's kind of like a marriage, but it's really not because they've really got you by the uh, they really have your data uh, kind of in a hole. And uh, it's kind of not like a marriage because when you get divorced, not that I know anything about divorce, but it, you can't just divide up all your stuff and go a different way. They have control of your data, and if you separate from them and go with another company, it may be hard to get that data back from them. You imagine if you have a big contract with Philips and you decide to leave them and go with GE, and you know when Philips finds out you're going with another vendor, how incentivized is Philips going to be to upgrade your network or upgrade your database or spend a lot of time migrating your data to work with the GE system. So we, we have to think about that when we migrate it. And in some ways, your PAX company may kind of be like your operating system. If we upgrade our Windows system every seven years ago, maybe PAX life has a shelf life of about seven years, and we may be migrating all the time. Usually with that PAX database, we think about it as two databases, one with all the images and one with a pointer to where the images live. So sometimes you can leave the image database alone and just migrate the pointer database. But depending on how it's set up and what system you have, it may vary like that. And you never want to be in a situation where vendor number one has to invest a lot of time and energy and money to upgrade your system just so that you can migrate it all to vendor number two. So becoming filmless has really been the big thing for us in, in the radiology and in the medical imaging world over the past 20 or 30 years. There are only about 1% of hospitals that were truly filmless in 2001. Uh, but it progressed very quickly. Even by two, uh, two the, uh, 2006, about a quarter of outpatient centers were. So the next thing is really going paperless to getting rid of those pieces of paper and doing digital protocoling and everything else. Because a lot of sites still have some paper involved in their process. Uh, so also, after 2000 or so, a lot of the sites had relatively older packs. You may have problems with upgrading or replacing the system. Uh, migrating your database as well as recycling all your hardware uh, became an issue with PAX after the second PAX purchase. And, uh, and part of the ways we want it to shift in that we recognize medical imaging is not just a radiology issue, but it's an enterprise thing. So we talk about Im imaging enterprise and uh, all the enterprise visible light colonoscopy, uh, visible light pictures of rashes, as well as medical imaging of, of radiology studies that we do all the time. Uh, so there's good and bad of these different things from a single vendor to uh, individual systems. Maybe you don't want a lot of finger pointing that you have this PACS and these modalities and this and so that the vendors are saying, well, it's his problem, not mine. He needs to upgrade this. 
and little things that seem obvious sometimes become a big issue. I really wanted a single keyboard and mouse in front of the radiologist so that they're on kind of working off one CPU. There are places where they have three mice and three keyboards in front of them all the time, PAX, speech, and wrist. But if you have one keyboard and mouse and everything running off of one box, you need all the vendors to sign off on the new version before you upgrade anything, your software, your hardware, anything else. If I'm gonna go from 32 to 64-bit architecture and try to use more RAM, I need all the software vendors to sign off on the new version of the hardware, and I need them to say that yes, I, ver I guarantee my software will work with these two other guys before I do that. And then the radiologists want internet access. They want to be able to check their email on the PAX version. They want a, a Microsoft Office on there so they can work on their PowerPoint slides and their talks. They want all this stuff loaded on there. So do you go you know, complete Nazi on your network and just have PAX and speech? You can't look at anything else. You can't load software. You can't have internet access. Or do you completely open it up? So every time they go to YouTube or some website, they download the new version of Flash that meshes up everything else uh, on your PAX workstation. How do you set privileges for what the radiologist can load on the PAX versus the administrator? And can the radiologist be an administrator? With the older system, I was a radiologist and an administrator, so I could do some things and work as a radiologist. But when we upgraded, I had to just be one, so now I'm just a radiologist. I can't do any of the admin stuff that I, I used to be able to do. Uh, so older systems may not meet newer standards as we progress. Uh, early adopters may not have met their financial goals. Uh, we think about printing film all the time and how much money we save over a period of time. Uh, PACs cost less, but it's a big financial investment right at the front. Uh, and then you uh, gain the money, but you have to keep it up and running for three or four years to get the financial investment back. Uh, or general PACs problems can be a huge variety of varied things. Uh, so we always get funny phone calls that say PAX is down or, you know, PAX is broken. Uh, well, maybe one of the monitors died. That's not really PAX is down. PAX is the whole system. But to that one user, maybe that's a big deal, especially if I can't get that guy to move over 10 feet to the, the PAX system next to him and use that one instead. Uh, some guy called and said the images won't come up. Well, he was trying to do an outside CD on his PAX workstation, and it was trying to load all the software. It's not really a PAX problem, but that was an IT call. Uh, the guy called and said nothing's work. Well, he was really in the conference room, and the LCD projector was broken and the bulb had died. Really not dealing with PACs, but that was a PAC stat help desk call. Uh, keyboard wasn't working. Turns out the fellow had spilled his lunch, his egg drop soup on the keyboard. He didn't talk about that initially, but he said the keyboard wasn't working. All the keys were sticky. Uh, some guy called once and said the colors were all wrong. He had actually tried to load the full version of Adobe Illustrator on the PACs workstation so that he could work on his... Uh, hard copy poster. And if you guys have worked with Adobe, boy, that, that takes control of your video card and it does not let go. So even when they rebooted, the colors were all still messed up from the video card we had for PAX. And uh, some guy said the speech mic was broken. Somebody had tried to play uh, U2's new CD on their PAX workstation, and of course the sound was just coming out the little speech mic, so it didn't work, so he left. But because it reconfigured the sound card, the next guy who came back, there was this loud screeching noise coming out of the speech. So he ripped the $1,000 speech mic out of the back of the PAX workstation and then called the PAX help desk and said that the speech mic wasn't working. Oh, really? Thanks. That's good. So there's a lot of issues to deal with uh, PAX and desktop support as well as uh, PAX replacement. And you want to have uh, some knowledge, at least, in all these different areas, uh, not just in the hardware and software, but the network and everything else. You want me to stop? Sure. So it, it's, it's a big deal in PAX deployment, and we think about the network as all as the imaging and everything else. So when we're setting up our network, we're thinking about redundancy and the servers, the core switches, the edge switches, and everything from desktop support, when are we sundowning this version of Windows, all the way up to speech recognition, natural language processing, you know, how do we go back and search through our reports, how do we data mine this data and go through wearable technology, uh, we have all these mobile devices where I can look at images anywhere, anytime. There's this huge range of things that are kind of going on in the imaging informatics world. And we're a little unique here, actually, that we've got eight or ten people, all who have some imaging informatics background uh, and could you know, give lectures like this. I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a lot of people I can involve in the SIM Society and the Program Committee and involve in a lot of different layers. There are people who look at DICOM, the image file format that we look at images 
digital imaging communication of medicine and uh, it, from desktop support all the way up to high level social media wearable technology mobile tech uh, there's a huge range of things that are going on in the imaging informatics world and it's really a very exciting time for us because the technology has progressed to the point where we can do a whole lot of cool things uh, with data mining and data researching and and big data uh, so i thank you very much for your attention and i hope if you're interested you'll uh, the students will think about the imaging informatics course in the in the spring thanks Yes, ma'am. Almost everybody is, but every now and then we still get outside studies that are sent with hard copy film. And, you know, because you can FedEx stuff anywhere, sometimes it's strange places. Somebody sent me images from Hong Kong that were still hard copy, and they still had all the stickers on and everything, so it looked like they're still on hard copy film. And we talk about developing or emerging markets sometimes. How we run radiology programs in the middle of nowhere in Africa is very interesting. In some ways, they're ahead of us because they didn't go through telegraph typing and Morse code and putting up these wires. They jumped straight to cellular technology. They just put up cell towers and everybody's got mobile phones. So they, they jumped way ahead in some areas. And there's an interesting initiative right now. The, it turns out Saudi Arabia has decided to invest a huge amount of money in medicine and they have a lot of money. So they're setting up a bunch of hospitals going straight digital. So they don't have this transition from analog to digital world. They're just gonna set it up and, and they plan to build hundreds of hospitals all around Saudi Arabia the next year. So they've actually come to us and asked Sim to come over there and kind of do a, a, an international road show of some speakers to talk about all these imaging informatics issues and to consult and help them set up all these hospitals. So while in North America, it's really PAX replacement market and almost everybody's, almost everybody's filmless now. Digital MAMO is really the last place usually to go filmless because uh, everybody's used to hard copy film and you want very high resolution. You need higher resolution monitors to look at digital MAMO images in terms of spatial resolution, how many dots across and dots up and down the monitor are. Uh, so most places in North America are now filmless, uh, but in these emerging markets, there's still a lot of people printing film, it turns out. And as all these other groups, like AREP is looking at going digital, how they do surge path is different than cytology, and how they're going to digitize all of that is, is going to be a big deal in the future. One slide, you digitize it, it might be two gig for each image. And one slide, you might take pictures at maybe three different magnifications and two different depths of the slide. How are you going to digitize that? How do you store it? Are there state rules about where you store it, how long you need to keep it, and everything else? So that there's a wide variety of what's going on out there, it turns out. Yes, sir? Yeah, and security is a huge deal. Oh, it's a huge amount of security. Years ago, I, I wanted to get these little uh, keyboards where they're biometrics. You put your finger down and it automatically logged you on. And it was great because I could be at one workstation, log on and save it, go to another workstation, put, and it would come up just like I had it. But there were a couple of people whose fingerprints, it turns out, were too close. So there were two or three people who would log on at e as each other sometimes. And there's security all the way through, you know, from somebody who wants to look at Carl Malone's knee MRI, and, you know, who's a, a tech in some other ICU, all the way to the radiologist and patient information. So security is a huge deal. In a lot of ways, medicine is way behind these other fields in our security and how we secure our databases. Mobile technology is a big deal. Do you want everybody to have their smartphone encrypted? You know, that, that's what held BlackBerry in the cellular market for a long time. Now, if you can have Android and iPhones that are encrypted, you know, the government and the DOD, other people can leave BlackBerry and go to these other smartphone devices. So there's a, a bunch of different levels of security issues, all the way from the USB drives we look at, uh, do securing all our laptops and external hard drives and everything else that we use. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.